we'll start yes good evening all so i hope all the postgraduates know what case is being discussed right okay sure you can start respected teachers my dear fellows and pgs a very good evening to one and all present here myself priya prabhu veteranal fellow myself dr margi glakuma uh, fellow Uh, we are here to present an interesting case for the grand rounds and the session will be moderated by dr vjp sir and dr rld ma'am the case it's a 46 year old male who presented to a opd on 13 july with complaints um, of sudden de de painless defective vision in the left eye for the past 3 days there was no history of any prior trauma ocular history the patient had uh, underwent a right eye vitreoretinal surgery 17 years back but records were not previous records were not available and the patient had also complained of poor vision following the surgery a uh, family history the patient had uh, there was a history of retinal detachment in the father systemic history the patient was a known case of hypertension and had underwent bendal's prosthetic aortic valve replacement surgery for aortic root aneurysm with severe aortic regurgitation in 2022 two years back and patient was currently on anticoagulants tablet azitromycin which is tablet warfarin 2 and 3 mg on alternate days tablet aspirin 150 mg once a day tablet metoprolol 25 mg once a day and tablet lasix furosemide 40 mg half tablet bd on examination the right eye the visual acuity was pr pl accurate and in the left eye it was 618 there was no improvement with glasses the intraocular pressure measured by goldman's aplanation tonometry in the right eye it was 16 mm hg and in the left eye it was reduced it was 8 mm hg anterior segment uh, examination of the right eye as shown in the picture Uh, it showed that uh, there was band shaped keratopathy there was peripheral anterior synecae with adherent leukoma and the anterior chamber was shallow and uh, hence the posterior segment couldn't be visualized whereas for the left eye the cornea was clear the anterior chamber was normal von herich's grade 4 the pupil was reacting to light but it was myotic and it was a non dilating pupil and even though the patient did not give any history of undergoing surgery in the left eye the patient was aphakic uh, since the uh, uh, pupils were severely myotic uh, only the posterior pole could be visualized and it was showing a white reflex on a retroillumination which appeared like retinal detachment uh, hold on uh, how would you explain aphakia without any surgical intervention what is the vision go back 618 sir 618 618 yeah yeah dislocation of the lens okay so okay it, there was no refractive error there was no refractive okay error. then what else can you infer from that patient had 618 vision you're telling it was a spontaneously posterior dislocated lens and he was 618 and there was no refractive error that's what she's telling she did a refraction any other fellows high myopia yeah okay sure okay A small recap uh, on to the ocular history of the patient two years back. The patient presented with complaints of floaters in the left eye for two months, and his distant uh, visual acuity in the right eye it was the same. It was PR PL inaccurate, and in the left eye it was six nine. Uh, but there was no improvement with glasses. As sir told, it was due to the high myopia, and uh, near vision was N six with one point five diopter sphere. The intraocular pressure in the right eye was ten, and in the left eye it was twenty mm hg. Uh, since the pupil was myotic and optos was uh, ordered because it's a wide field imaging modality where you can visualize the fundus and it is helpful in such myotic pupils uh, in the optos picture you can see that there is a myopic uh, uh, disc with a peripapillary atrophy the macula appears normal there are few chorea retinal atrophic patches which are seen uh, nasal and inferior to the disc b scan of uh, both the eyes were also ordered and uh, the right eye ultrasound b scan was uh, showing uh, reverb anterior reverberation echoes and uh, it was showing an apparently enlarged globe due to being an oil filled eye and the retina appeared to be attached the ultrasound of the left eye showed that there was no definitive lens echo which was noted in the pupillary plane Uh, but there was a globular uh, clump echo uh, which was uh, highly reflective and seen in the inferior vitreous cavity which is suggestive of a spontaneously dislocated uh, lens in the posterior vitreous cavity and uh, there were a few uh, reflective uh, echoes uh, noted in the vitreous cavity with good after movement suggestive of a pvd and uh, retina appeared to be attached and uh, the choroid and optic nerve head were normal The OCT of the left eye uh, showed a normal foveal contour. The foveal thickness was 158 microns, and you can appreciate that it's a high myope, so there is hardly any thickness of the choroid. It is only about 26 microns. Uh, because the baseline IOP was 
ஆமாம் த லெஃப்ட் ஐ தேர் இஸ் நோ டெஃபினட்டிவ் லென்ஸ் எக்கோ நோட்டட் இன் த பியூப்புலரி பிளேன் பட் தேர் இஸ் க்ளோபுலர் ஹைலி ரிஃப்ளெக்டிவ் எக்கோ விச் இஸ் நோட்டட் இன் த இன்ஃபீரியர் விக்ட்ரியஸ் காவிட்டி விச் இஸ் சஜஸ்டிவ் ஆஃப் போஸ்டலி டிஸ்லொகேட்டட் லென்ஸ் அண்ட் தேர் வேர் அ ஃபியூ மெம்ப்ரேன் எக்கோஸ் விச் ஷோட் குட் ஆஃப்டர் மூமெண்ட்ஸ் விச் வாஸ் சஜஸ்டிவ் ஆஃப் அ பிவிடி அண்ட் த ரெட்டினா அப்பியர்ட் அட்டாச்சு and uh, the choroid was normal uh, in the optic nerve head there was a small excavation probably due to posterior staphyloma and the axial length was uh, 33 mm uh, in the previous visit because the baseline iop was uh, seen as 20 mm edge in the left eye one diagonal variation test was ordered and it was found to be in the range of 16 to 20 mm of edge and uh, pachymetry was 559 microns the disc as we saw before was a tilted myopic disc so one uh, field test was done next so this was the field test of the left eye at that point it showed some central scotoma uh, but it was not corresponding with the disc findings um, so the patient was asked to come back for a follow up after 3 months coming back to the present scenario this was the optos picture of the patient what do you think is the diagnosis this is a comparison showing the previous and the current picture anybody please start uh, telling the difference it's a pseudo color image but so the media is uh, media haze is there okay some media haze is there okay there are some choroidal folds uh, choroidal folds inferior no it's a tessellated fundus no choroidal folds here if you look at the temporal retina when you compare to the nasal or the superior retina you see that the uh, retina looks little lifted it's a 2d image but you need a stereoscopic perception but still you can make out slightly that the retina is detached at least temporarily so the main clue that we get is a uh, choroidal hue is lost it is clearly visible over here and it is lost here so it is probably a shallow retinal detachment Uh, on this was confirmed on uh, b scan of the left eye which was showing a uh, variable uh, dome shaped uh, elevation in the left eye so there was a variable uh, reflective uh, um, echo which was noted which was uh, involving 360 degrees suggestive of a uh, uh, choroidal detachment it was a dome shaped elevation and uh, here uh, it was a highly reflective membrane which was persisting in low gain with poor after moments it is a very shallow retinal detachment so the plan of management for this patient was uh, patient was uh, uh, plan for left eye uh, lensectomy with vitrectomy belt buckling endolaser and silicone oil injection under local anesthesia and a steroid cover to treat for the choroidal detachment at the earliest and uh, patient was started on topical steroids hourly antibiotic to hourly and atropine eye drops bd till surgery and since the patient was one eyed a conjunctival swab of the left eye was ordered on physician fitness uh, the patient's coagulation pro- profile was asked for because the patient was on uh, warfarin tablet the pt and aptt were prolonged but the bt ct was normal the inr was 1.6 for a normal individual it would be expected between 0.8 to 1.2 but for patients who are on anticoagulants the normal therapeutic range is between 2 to 3 so this value is acceptable clot retraction was good and the other investigations were normal since the patient had underwent an aortic valve replacement surgery an echo and cardiologist opinion was asked for the echo showed a uh, normal uh, ejection fraction of 66% and the cardiologist had uh, uh, asked to stop the ta- warfarin tablet for 5 days and replace it with uh, heparin injection 5000 international units four times a day um, for 5 days and this injection has to be stopped on the day of surgery and patient uh, can restart the warfarin tablet after the surgery this is the bridge therapy normal regimen and uh, hence fitness was given under high risk this inr was withheld out that acitrom or on acitrom that inr range was 1.66 on acitrom sir it's quite low only it's quite low yeah okay so while awaiting fitness uh, it was noticed that the choroidal detachment had uh, increased and uh, in this picture it is better appre- the retinal detachment is better appreciated compared to the previous optos and uh, even a part of the posterior dislocated lens can also be visualized Uh, the ultrasound b scan is also showing that the choroidal detachment has increased so when we are doing a serial uh, measurement of uh, uh, progression or whether it has uh, whether the choroidal detachment has reduced we do uh, measure the maximum height of the choroidal detachment in this case it is uh, visible clearly that it has increased it is about 8.7 mm 
Steroid fitness was obtained and patient was started on tablet prednisolone 50 mg in a weekly tapering dose and the conjunctival swab report of the left eye was negative. Uh, patient was given a high risk consent and uh, was advised injection augmented 1.2 mg IV one hour before surgery as a part of uh, endocarditis prophylaxis and in advised injection Lasix IV uh, six hours before surgery. Patient was already on bridge therapy by now from 26th. So ultrasound B scan taken uh, just a day before the surgery uh, also showed that uh, the choroidals were only mildly reduced uh, compared to the previous scan. And uh, OCT of the left eye uh, showed that there was macular edema and there was uh, a subretinal fluid and uh, there was retinal corrugations. Intraoperatively, uh, since the patient was meiotic, um, the iris hooks were used for pupillary dilatation. Uh, choroidal drainage was attempted through the sclerotomy ports which were directed supracoroidally. Uh, however, only a partial drainage could be done. Uh, the nucleus remnant was removed uh, using cutter and uh, two pre-existing breaks were noted at 5 and uh, at uh, 9 o'clock which were lasered and uh, peripheral iridotomy was done inferiorly. Um, and uh, silicon oil uh, tamponade of 1300 centistokes was used. So usually when we uh, do a silicon oil injection, we would uh, plan to do a slight underfill to prevent the IOP spike on the next day. But in this patient, since there were uh, residual choroidals which were already present, uh, the patient was given an adequate oil fill uh, so that once the CDs resolve, uh, it would compensate for that. Uh, so about the, since the patient was a high myope with about 33 mm axial length, about 10 ml of silicone oil was being used. And uh, the AC was uh, formed with saline at the end and there was no oil noted in the AC. On the first post-operative day, uh, the cornea was showing an epithelial defect. Intraoperatively, the corneal epithelium was debrided for better visualization. The anterior chamber was shallow centrally and peripherally. And uh, the posterior segment, uh, it was showing that uh, the breaks were well lasered and uh, the retina was appearing attached and the belt buckle indent was also found to be adequate. However, the intraocular pressure measured was found to be high. It was 32 mmHg. So on POD1, when uh, we saw the patient, patient had 32 pressures with uh, grade 2 shallow AC with an epithelial defect. And uh, shallow residual CDs were also there. Patient was given an uh, oral acetazolamide tablet four times a day, asked to maintain strict prone position. And I was patched for early healing of the epithelial defect. Next day, the pressures came down to 18. And we started on topical anti-glaucoma medications. So patient was seen serially till day 16. Uh, tablet uh, Dimox was stopped at fifth day and patient was maintaining uh, good pressures by uh, POD8 itself without Dimox tablet and the CDs had resolved but the AC was still uh, slightly shallow throughout. On POD19 when we saw the patient pressures were fine 16, AC was still grade 2 shallow. The CDs had resolved and the patient was come, asked to come at GA visit. Patient had ambulatory vision at this point of time. One minute. So this patient in the early post-op had high IOP with shallow anterior chamber. So uh, what could you possibly uh, think of the causes for that? Of course, vitrectomy with silicon oil, with belt buckle, with a patent PI. So what are the, if there was no oil in AC? Um, Coroidal hemorrhage itself. Uh Initially, there was no there was no choroidal hemorrhage. There was choroidal detachment, serous. Yeah, that could be a cause of shallow AC. But then the IOP would have been on the lower side. But here the IOP was also high. Yeah, that's one thing. Then could have been an overfill, a slightly overfill. Yeah. Patient also had a belt buckle. So how can belt buckle cause a closure, angle closure? or a shallowing of the anterior chamber. How? What is the mechanism? Ma'am, it can uh, compress the vortex vein and cause choroidal effusion and also causes the anterior rotation of ciliary body. Yes, and causes because shallowing forward of the movement anterior. of the lens yes. iris. Yeah. But here the belt buckle, its uh, height was also adequate. Huh? But eventually I think it formed slightly better. Slightly better. Okay. If there was overfill, the IOP will never come to a normal range, okay? So this was not an overfill. Uh, ciliary body edema could be a reason because laser was done 360 degrees and post-surgery CDs were there preoperatively. So inflammation was there, so that might be a reason. 
However, the patient presented to us on the post-operative day 22 with complaints of uh, severe pain in the left eye uh, for the past one day and patient was very symptomatic with a lot of pain and was in severe distress. On examination, the anterior segment, uh, the, the AC was shallow, grade 2, and the intraocular pressure was 45 mmHg, and this was the posterior segment uh, optos photo. So what do you think is the diagnosis? Okay, you, are, you can describe and you can tell, no problem. So when you compare with the previous picture, you can see that there is a dome-shaped uh, elevations which were seen uh, inferiorly, nasally, and extending superiorly. And uh, it was more appreciated clinically. It was uh, a case of uh, hemorrhagic choroidal detachment uh, with a case of secondary glaucoma. Previous slide. So it's not seen well in the pseudo color, but it was actually red, actually. The elevations you see inferior to the disc and all, they were all red in color, actually. Mm -hmm. So the diagnosis in this case would be a delayed, uh, limited, non-oppositional suprachoroidal hemorrhage. It is limited because it is not uh, diffuse, and it is non-oppositional because still silicon oil is holding on. It is preventing a kissing choroidals, and uh, it is um, choroidal detachment in a silicon oil filled eye with secondary glaucoma. And whether we can call this as spontaneous or delayed postoperative, how do we label this hemorrhagic choroidal detachment? It was on the postoperative day 22. Post vitrectomy, aphakia. In a patient on? On anticoagulants. That's what will tell you your answer no? later. Yes, ma'am. We'll be discussing about this in our discussion. So this patient has a hemorrhagic CD with a raised IOP. What, what are the treatment options that you can think of? Should we intervene immediately or what should we do in this case? Patient is in very severe pain. Patient can't sit. He is very, very, in a very severe pain. What do you want to do? What is the cause for the pain? The increased IOP. Raised IOP then? Ciliary muscle spasm. Uh, and what is the other reason? In a supracoral hemorrhage. Yeah. Stretching of the? Yeah, posterior ciliary nerve. So for the raised pressures, first we tried to manage the patient with uh, med medically. Uh, we gave him uh, injection mannitol, uh, IV, 200 so we cc. We cannot go in for surgery because the patient is on warfarin. So we cannot take up for a immediate surgery, immediate surgery. Otherwise, even otherwise. Yes, sir. So we gave him injection mannitol and started him on tablet Dimox, gave him maximum medical therapy. And for two consecutive days, uh, the pressure still remained the same. Uh, it did not come down. We also added atropine and further AGMs and glycerol. But the uh, IOP was still the same. At this point, the gonioscopy uh, was showing hazy view, but it, the angles appeared closed. And the patient was asked to continue the oral steroids in a tapering dose. Next. So we had to choose between the two options at this point. With medical management, we were not able to bring down the pressure, so some intervention had to be done. At this point, uh, silicon oil, ta oil tapping was deferred uh, due to two main reasons. One is that uh, once we do an oil tap, it would result in a hypotony on table, which itself may uh, cause an increase in the hemorrhagic CDs. And the second reason is that there is a risk of rec uh, recurrent retinal detachment in this patient. And this patient being one-eyed, it had to be considered even more. So we plan to do a diet CPC for the patient. So when the patient was sent for uh, fitness, physician fitness for uh, diode CPC, that was when we had a surprise on investigation. The PT and the APTT were prolonged. And uh, the INR was 5, which is almost double of the normal therapeutic range of 2.5. And so the patient was asked to stop the uh, acetrom tablet. And the patient was uh, uh, asked to take uh, injection uh, fragment, which is a low molecular weight heparin, once a day, uh, subcutaneously on the, the POD 24 and 25. So it was decided that if the INR was normal, after the two days of stopping warfarin, the patient would be taken up. And the INR was found to be 1.3, and hence a fitness for diode CPC was obtained. So uh, we did a diode CPC in inferiorly 180 deg degrees, pairing the 3 and 9 o'clock position. 30 shots were given. Patient was advised to continue topical anti-glaucoma medications with uh, topical steroids and cycloplegics. Next, please. So next day, after diet CPC, the pressures went up to 56. AC was flat with tense lid edema and microcystic corneal edema. Hemorrhagic CDs were as before. We added uh, oral 
acetazolamide and glycerol next so you can see that following diode cpc there is not much change in the hemorrhagic cds it remains almost the same the iop was also no so we don't expect it to change only the iop we would expect it to fall so the um, oct picture which was taken uh, before the retinal before the retinal detachment surgery it is showing srf and we can see on pod 27 that the srf has completely resolved and uh, just inferior to the macula we can see that there is uh, still residual srf which was present which was an important thing to consider when we are doing a uh, oil tapping no, no, srf is not completely reduced uh, see the vertical scan here that's the horizontal scan the left side is a vertical scan you see the inferior retina there's still detachment no the lower picture yeah, the lower part, the inferior part, yeah. There is still subretinal fluid there. So, so this subretinal fluid, we are not sure whether it is a residual fluid post-surgery or is it associated with a cordial detachment because with a hemorrhagic cordial detachment, there's going to be an inflammation. There can be an exudative RD component also to it, okay? And this inferior is a detachment or only inferiorly. So again, that is a concern for doing oil tapping because the retina might detach when you remove uh, oil, especially being a inferior break. So the ultrasound B scan of the left eye, uh, we could not appreciate the hemorrhagic CDs because of being an oil filled eye, it was appearing, uh, globus appearing enlarged. Uh, there was just a retinochoroidal elevation noted in the inferior nasal quadrant and uh, the retina status and the choroidal status <laughs> couldn't be commented upon. Why was ultrasound tried in this patient? What was the other surgical option which was thought of? Coral drainage. You can drain the hemorrhagic caudal detachment. So this was done to see if there was any clot lysis of the lysis. hemorrhagic uh, CDs. But in an oil filled eye, you can't make out the um, lysis or anything details clearly. Ideally, it would take about 10 to 12 days for a clot to lyse in case of a hemorrhagic CDs. And we would monitor with a serial ultrasound, which would show a hyporeflective spaces. Hyperreflective echoes. So the intraocular pressure was still raised following diode CPC. And uh, by this time, the anterior chamber was not shallow, but it was completely flat. And uh, the hemorrhagic uh, CDs were also not resolving, even though the patient was on steroids. Uh, so how do we manage at this point of time? What is the option that we are left with? A patient has persistently high IOP, hemorrhagic detachment, oil filled dye, and the OCT is showing shallow SRF inferiorly. And now the AC, which was shallow, has now become flat. Drainage of the hemorrhagic cordial attachment, yes, that is an option. But again, you're not sure whether it is um, lysis has started on. Mostly it would have started by a week's time. Yes, that is an option. The other option uh, which we had was to do an oil tap. So in this patient, the main aim was to form an a form the AC. And uh, it, because the pressure is, you'll have to remove a little oil for the formation of the AC, an oil tap was planned. And the AC was flat, so if you leave a flat AC with a even an adequate oil fill, you will get permanent anterior sinic A. Then later on, even if you remove the oil, that is not going to resolve. Okay, so you have to go in when the AC becomes flat. So a cardiologist fitness was obtained for the procedure, and uh, in view of the um, high INR, once again the patient was put on bridge therapy uh, instead of tablet warfarin. Patient was substituted with the uh, enoxaparin injection. It's a darafactor ten inhibitor, and uh, patient was asked to once again restart the tablet warfarin following surgery. And always uh, such uh, bridge therapy they should be avoided uh, on the day of surgery before, uh, like six hours prior to the surgery. This is the normal guidelines. The uh, patient was asked to follow up with the proper PT and INR following surgery. So on 30th, uh, the patient was taken up for silicone oil tapping. Um, the silicone oil tapping, as we are told, it was mainly because of the flat AC. So next slide. One uh, single uh, 25 uh, gauge uh, sclerotomy port was made. And uh, we tried to form the PI was uh, uh, enlarged even a little more. Uh, just in case there were some membranes covering the PI. And uh, the AC was tried to be uh, reformed. Uh, but since uh, the it couldn't be reformed, uh, an oil was also, uh, t it was uh, a side port was made at 11 o'clock. Uh, the AC couldn't be formed because there was a uh, lot of uh, peripheral anterior sinecae. And uh, using an iris spatula, the sinecae and uh, the uh, PAS was completely released. And uh, later an oil tap was done. So uh, the oil was... 
No, sir, this is not the procedure. This is just to show that uh, this is the vent instrument. This is uh, showing uh, them that uh, a video just showing them that the oil tapping was done using a vent instrument. So what was the INR? Obtained? The INR was, uh, it was normal at that time. It was 1.8. Fitness was obtained after a cardiologist opinion. So this is a vent which was used for uh, tapping the silicon oil. So first post-operative day, the IOP was uh, relatively reduced. It was 26 mmHg. And uh, the anterior chamber, uh, before it was flat, but now it is uh, formed and it was relatively shallow. Um, posterior segment, uh, still uh, inferior hemorrhagic uh, corals were seen. Uh, most importantly, during the oil tapping, uh, luckily once the sclerotomy port was removed, a little bit of uh, clot lysis um, happened and a, f a little bit of that hemorrhagic CDs also could be drained. And that also had helped in the reduction of the IOP. So this is a picture following the oil tap. Uh, the, after the diode CPC, you can see there is a lot of hemorrhagic CDs, but it has relatively reduced following the silicon oil tap and the hemorrhagic CD drainage. This is a picture following the oil tap. Uh, the minimum SRF also had uh, reduced at the region of the macula and uh, inferior to the macula. This was a picture uh, taken on the latest visit two months later after the oil tap. Uh, the retina appears attached on OCT, but uh, on the optos, uh, you can appreciate the oil underfill. So the INR, which was uh, we learned a lesson and the INR was measured um, after the surgery and it was 2.3 and hence the patient was asked to follow up with their cardiologist and uh, the best corrected visual acuity in the left eye, uh, distant vision was, uh, it was 1 by 60 with a minus 7 diopter uh, spear correction and uh, the near vision was 6 by 36. What are the probable causes for a low vision in this patient in spite of an attached retina was probably due to choroidal ischemia. Uh, which in turn caused uh, macular photoreceptor degeneration. And there was also probable optic atrophy uh, due to the raised IOP during the period of nine days when the hemorrhagic CDs were there and the IOP was elevated. So you can see in the picture, this was during the initial visit and this is the latest visit. You can see definitely the optic disc looks more pale and uh, the vessel which is uh, arising in the peripapillary region, the superotemporal vessel is definitely thinned out and it is sclerosed. And macula, this is the initial visit and this is the latest visit. You can see that there is definitely a component of macular thinning, even though the retina is attached. So a pair of VEP and uh, ERG was ordered. So because the vision was reduced, uh, VEP and uh, ERG was ordered. And uh, VEP report showed that there was normal P2 latency and there was a grossly reduced amplitude. Um, and ERG was taken. Uh, which showed that there was a grossly reduced uh, scotopic and undetectable photopic response, which shows that the uh, photoreceptors had degenerated. This is the latest OCTA picture. Uh, here the segmentation lines are not proper because of the patient being a high myope. So at the last visit, the patient's pressures, uh, intraocular pressure was 25 mmHg. The AC was formed with P patent PI, but uh, we had to add further add topical AGMs for the patient. The gonio showed complete synical closure. Next, we tried to get one uh, HVF for the patient. It showed constricted fields, but the foveal threshold, if you check, it is three decibels. Moving on to the discussion. So moving on to the classification of anticoagulants, uh, routinely patients would be put on warfarin, which is a vitamin K antagonist. Uh, but there are also newer drugs which directly act on thrombin. That is the factor 10 to 10A. And then you have the thrombin. So the thrombin inhibitors uh, include a dabigatran, which is an oral drug. And uh, you also have parenteral drugs, uh, such as ergotrobin. And you also have indirect factor 10 inhibitors, uh, such as uh, Fonda Parinox, and uh, indirect thrombin inhibitors. Uh, which is the low molecular weight heparin, which is used for, uh, that is enoxaparin, daltaparin, tinzaparin, and nadroparin, which are the low molecular weight heparins used for the bridge therapy. So the guidelines, uh, which is uh, followed in our hospital protocol is that regardless of whatever is the systemic status of the patient, and uh, regardless of whatever is the indication of the surgery, we'll have to stop the patient on oral uh, anticoagulants warfarin tablet at least for five days prior to the surgery. And you have to re uh, make the patient uh, on a, put them on a bridge therapy with uh, 
either a low molecular weight heparin or a direct factor 10 inhibitor. And most importantly, this has to be stopped on the day of the surgery, six hours prior to surgery. And following surgery, the warfarin tablet can be restarted. But the bridge therapy should not be discontinued because it takes time for the warfarin to start acting. So they would, after surgery, they would have to simultaneously take both the warfarin tablet along with the bridge therapy. And you will have to monitor the patient for the INR. So once the patient comes on post-operative day visit, apart from the ocular, even the systemic status has to be uh, followed through. And we have to ask them to get back with, to their cardiologist. So what are the guidelines for the other drugs? If the patient is on antiplatelets like aspirin or clopilet, we'll have to stop it for five days prior to surgery, but the patient is, does not need a bridge therapy. And if the patient is on uh, newer drugs, uh, like the factor 10 inhibitors, dabigotran, they'll have to they'll have to stop it for just one to three days prior to surgery, but there is no requirement for any bridge therapy. It's important for all of us to know this when we are seeing a patient uh, preoperatively and postoperatively to ensure that they are following this correctly. So the ideal therapeutic range is, uh, desirable range is 2.5 uh, with a range of 2 to 3. And uh, the PT and INR will definitely be checked for preoperatively for fitness, but postoperatively also the patient has to be monitored and asked to follow up with your cardiologist. So the fact is that the why did this patient have a high INR of 5? We asked the patient that did they uh, change the dose of the tablets, but it was not. They were just taking how they were prescribed and as an alternate dose of 2 and 3 milligram. So there are several drugs which also affect the metabolism of warfarin. So there are drugs like even uh, painkillers, which we give like astaminophen also, which can affect and increase the INR. And uh, several antibiotics also increase the INR. So we should be aware of what are the interactions which can affect the INR. The other interesting fact is that there is something called as a warfarin diet where the patients who are on anticoagulants uh, should have only an optimum amount of uh, all the vitamin K rich foods uh, because they should not uh, increase uh, or have a reduced intake of the uh, required daily dose of vitamin K to avoid variations in the INR. So moving on to studies which uh, uh, support the use of for, uh, oral steroids for uh, um, coral detachment, uh, there is a study in-house publication by Tarun Sharma sir, where the uh, combined uh, cases with retinal detachment and coral detachment, the retinal reattachment rates were uh, looked for uh, after a dose of oral steroids preoperatively and the retinal uh, reattachment rates were found to improve. There were some studies which said otherwise, which uh, said that there was no improvement in the retinal reattachment or visual acuity of the patients postoperatively. There were some studies which compared the effect of intravitreal uh, steroids uh, versus uh, systemic oral steroids and they found that uh, both had uh, comparable outcomes. So there is a review article uh, which is also an in-house publication by uh, Shashwanti Mohan uh, and uh, it is about a review article on uh, supracoral hemorrhage, what are the causes, what are the mechanism and uh, what are the main risk factors. Next. So the risk factors for a coral detachment, uh, there are, you can divide it into ocular and systemic causes. In case of ocular, uh, aphakia, increased axial length, prior SAH in the fellow eye, uh, choroidal lesions, uh, ARMD, uveitis or past trauma, past intraocular surgery, past vitrectomized eyes, hypotony and uncontrolled high IOP, both the spectrum, they can result in uh, coral detachment. And uh, systemic causes include uh, uh, advanced age, hypertension, uh, diabetic, uh, arteriosclerosis, valsalva maneuver, uh, or even activities like emesis, which can increase the pressure and result in bleeding, uh, hemodialysis, liver disease, blood dyscrasias, polycythemia, thrombocytopenia, and as in our patient, uh, those who are on antiplatelets or anticoagulants. So what is the mechanism of the delayed uh, supracoral hemorrhage, the coral detachment in this patient? Uh, so what are the uh, mechanisms include that? It, uh, during surgery, you can have a direct trauma using the instruments during the incision. And uh, there is a lot of IOP fluctuations. Uh, as you know, during the VR surgeries, once there is bleeding, we increase the IOP. And immediately later, we reduce the IOP. So all these IOP fluctuations itself can be a factor. Uh, external indentation, which is done to check the periphery, internal drainage of SRF, the scleral buckling uh, itself can obstruct the vortex veins, and uh, the globe manipulation during surgery, and uh, extensive cryotherapy, um, and retinal detachment itself is found to be a risk factor uh, due to the damage to the coronal vessels. So there is another article which uh, discusses the delayed supracoronal hemorrhage after uh, pass vitrectomy. So there was a five-year results which were analyzed. 
So they had uh, inclusion criteria was that uh, the supracoral hemorrhage was uh, that which presented following surgery within 48 hours. And of these, about 36 uh, uh, patients had presented within the first day and about three of them had presented on the second day. Uh, the significant associated factors which were noted was increased age, hypertension, anticoagulant or antiplatelet use, increased axial length, uh, epiretinal membrane, extensive photocoagulation, air or gas tamponade, and emesis because it causes uh, valsalva maneuver-like action and uh, causes bleeding. So in our patient, what were the risk factors? Of course, the patient was aphakic, uh, high myope with a large axial length of 33 mm. Patient was a hypertensive, patient was an anticoagulant warfarin and probably the, due to the extensive photocoagulation. So uh, what are the two types of coral detachment? Uh, we need to know that for us to know how the management will vary. For uh, a serious coral detachment is uh, one where the IOP is low, whereas it is high in case of a hemorrhagic CDs. Uh, serious detachment, the etiology is mo mostly inflammatory or associated with the retinal detachment, whereas in a hemorrhagic, uh, it is due to the rupture of the posterior ciliary arteries or the vortex veins. Uh, Transillumination for a serous CD, it would be uh, present, whereas it is absent for a hemorrhagic CD. Uh, the pain would be not it would not be present in a serous CD, whereas it would be present in a hemorrhagic CD. Visual acuity will be good in a serous CD, but it will be poor in a hemorrhagic CD. And B scan will show that that will be echolucent within the dome shaped elevation in case of a serous CD, but it will be echo dense in case of a hemorrhagic CD. So our patient had all these symptoms. So with the symptoms itself, we could make out the diagnosis of hemorrhagic CD. The IOP was high, patient was in severe pain, and of course, it was uh, visual acuity was also less. So what is the medical management of a coral detachment? Uh, first is that if it's a hemorrhagic CD, like in our case, we have to manage with uh, giving maximum medical therapy for anti-glaucoma medications. Uh, we can also start the patient on topical and oral steroids and uh, also cycloplegics and NSAIDs uh, for symptomatic relief. And uh, as in hemorrhagic CDs, uh, we had taken an ultrasound, but we could not appreciate. But normally, this is how a clot lysis looks like. Uh, you'll be able to see usually after 10 to 12 days. However, in some scenarios, we don't wait for 10 to 12 days. We would take up the patient for a coral drainage much earlier surgically. So what are the indications for them? Next slide. So what the indications include uh, uncontrolled IOP and a pupillary block, flat AC as in our patient with uh, extensive uh, peripheral anterior sinicae, kissing choroidals which may lead to uh, retinal additions over a period of time. Um, associate if it is associated with a uh, ret regmatogenous retinal detachment, uh, if there is a persistent decreased visual acuity and there is a persistent and progressive or there is a progressive increase in the coral detachment in spite of a maximum conservative management. So there is an article which describes the stepwise approach for the surgical management of hemorrhagic CDs. Next where it uh, says uh, that first step is to do a less invasive uh, intervention, which is to place a trocar. And the trocar would be ideally, uh, instead of placing it perpendicular, directed towards the vitreous cavity, here we would be direct directing it supracoroidally at an angulation of 30 degrees. And uh, this is mostly done for serous uh, CDs, which extend more anteriorly, and they can be drained by this method. If the CD cannot be drainage by, uh, drained by this, we go on to the step two, which is you try to place the trocar at a second place where uh, the CD is at the highest point. This is where the uh, ultrasound helps us. It helps us to determine at which quadrant the CD height is maximum and we can drain it accordingly. Or we can even use an active aspiration. We connect a needle and then we do an active aspiration of the CD. Next step. The step three is that we will have to do a more uh, invasive scleral cut down technique. This technique uh, is demonstrated in the video, in the next, next video, where uh, so this is a, a case uh, of a traumatic uh, hemorrhagic CD uh, where a scleral cut down technique as well as a cannula uh, insertion technique is used for the CD drainage. You can see that initially peritomy is done and uh, after peritomy we uh, place the we have we need to sufficiently expose uh, up at least the, the point of sclera cut down should be about 7 mm away from the limbus. And so we need to sufficiently uh, expose the sclera for that. You can see here that uh, after the cannula insertion, there is uh, a hemorrhagic CD being drained. And this is a buckle knife which is used to form for the scleral cut down technique. Uh, a controlled uh, incision is being done. So you can see that the CD is being drained. And we also use cotton tipped applicators to uh, put pressure to drain it further or we can also use an AC maintainer or uh, we can even the infusion can be uh, turned on but we have to be careful while placing the infusion it should be uh, directed uh, correctly within the pars plana to uh, prevent uh, 
the worsening of the CD. The most po important is to have a positive pressure from inside. So either you can use a AC maintainer or your pass plan uh, infusion cannula, but it should be inside the vitreous cavity. So with positive pressure and an opening behind, the blood will slowly drain out. So it's important to have an adequate oil fill uh, during the surgery. It's like a Goldilocks principle where you can't have the soup too hot or too cold. So here the overfill itself can cause complications uh, such as a raised IOP and it can cause even coronal decompensation. But uh, oil underfill on the other hand can cause a recurrent uh, retinal detachment and can result in PVR. So we have to do a adequate oil fill. So what are the steps to ensure an adequate oil fill uh, on table is that we look at the oil reflex and uh, the meniscus when it is approaching. Once uh, it is more denser, so first it settles down and then it comes up. So once the silicone oil comes approaching towards the lens or the IOL, we will be able to make out the reflex. And uh, if beyond that, you also have other indicators like the plugging of the uh, infusion line with the silicone oil. And uh, you can also, once you remove the sclerotomy ports for suturing, at that point if the oil leaks, it shows that it has reached up to that point and there's an adequate fill. And uh, definitely finger tension is being used for, so that uh, to see if there is a eye is a little more tense or it is a little soft for us to titrate on what decision to make. We've already discussed this. Next. 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 So, a uh, little about the IOP elevation after pass plenar vitrectomy. In case IOP is the second most common complication of PPV with silicon oil tamponade after cataract formation with a prevalence of 2.2 to 56 percent. In a prospective study by Hanatel, the incidence of rise in IOP following PPV was noted to be by 55 to 22 mmHg in 61 percent of the eyes. Fakic eyes are reported to develop a delayed raised IOP response compared to pseudo fakic and a fakic eyes. Next. So this is about the mechanism of uh, silicon oil associated secondary glaucoma. It can be acute or chronic. Acute if it presents with open angles, it could be due to blockage of the trabecular meshwork by silicon oil globules or it could be due to inflammation. With closed angles, it could be pupillary block or silicon oil overfill. In chronic cases, the op with open angles, it could be a steroid response or emulsified silicon oil clogging the trabecular meshwork, causing sclerosis and collapse of the trabecular meshwork. Closed angles, it could be because of the synechial angle closure. Next. So lens plays an important role as uh, it will, uh, whenever there is post-PPV, there will be surgically induced oxidative stress leading to production of free radicals. Also, the surgically induced inflammation uh, will cause blockage of the trabecular meshwork. So lens acts as a mechanical barrier for the inflammatory mediators, and it also scavenges the free radicals and can prevent raised pressures. Next. So about the role of surgical peripheral adductotomy, uh, aphakic eyes need a prophylactic uh, inferior peripheral adductotomy at the time of PPV. It enables the aqueous to pass from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber when the silicon oil occludes the pupil. There was a study by uh, Al Joseph at all which uh, reported that no patient in their study of uh, 450 eyes developed pupillary block after an inferior PI, which was performed wherever needed in, aphic, in all the aphakic and pseudophakic eyes with ACIOL. However, the closure of PI was reported to occur in 14% of the cases needing reopening or a new PI. Next, uh, about the role of diode CPC in oil-filled eyes, it can play a role in refractory glaucoma post-VR surgeries where no other glaucoma surgeries are possible. Uh, Shivanan will at all analyze the results of uh, diode CPC in reducing the IOP refractory to medical treatment in a group of 18 patients with uh, silicon oil filled. And the study found that there was a mean reduction of 49% from pre-treatment IOP level, and there was overall success rate of 44%. Next, please. Regarding the role of mannitol in vitrectomized eyes, uh, mannitol usually we know plays a role by causing a vitreous dehydration, but in vitrectomized eyes, there was a study by Ram Chandra et al. They conducted a prospective study to compare the effect of mannitol in reducing IOP in uh, vitrectomized and non-vitrectomized eyes. They concluded that mannitol reduces IOP significantly in both the groups. The possible mechanism could be the central nervous system co uh, controls the IOP via osmoreceptors in hypothalamus, which decreases the aqueous production along with the direct osmotic mechanism. Next. 
So the take home message uh, from this is that we have to monitor the I INR post-operatively and we have to ask the patient to follow up with your respective cardiologist. And we should know the guidelines for bridge therapy uh, depending on the drug that the patient is taking for anticoagulation or antiplatelets. And we should know the risk factors for development of coral uh, detachment and uh, the medical management along with the surgical management when to intervene, what are the indications and uh, what, how to manage the secondary glaucoma in such special scenarios. Next slide. So we would like to thank uh, uh, VJP sir, RLD ma'am, LG sir, PB sir, TAD ma'am, RK sir, CR sir, and TSP ma'am for your valuable contribution. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Sir, uh, did we drain the CDs during oil tapping or we yeah, just... During uh, the oil tapping, we did not plan to do the dra drainage of the hemorrhagic <laughs> CDs, yes. but uh, some of it came actually while removing the cannula, okay. the port actually, while removing it. Uh, the altered blood did come out. So, so that was the reason that SRF gone back, inferior SRF that we noticed has reduced. No, the SRF I think could have been inflammatory SRF. Inflammatory SRF. So once the inflammation and the, this thing settled down, the SRF went back. Even the hemorrhagic CDs did reduce. Okay, sir. Uh, so LG, sir. Uh, yeah, are, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. You are here now, sir. Yeah, see, um, just a few points. In fact, <coughs> when we operated nearly about seven days after the event, is it how many days after the coronal hemorrhage did we operate for removing the oil? After the patient presented, uh, we operated after two weeks, sir. No, no, not two, two, weeks. two weeks. So no, two weeks is adequate time for us to even drain the supracoronal blood. So I was wondering why we could not have put those cannulas right posteriorly where the hemorrhage is located because the easiest way to drain a supracoronal blood would be to put the same trocar cannula right uh, where the coronal hemorrhage is even at the equatorial level no problem because your needle cannot go through the supracoronal hemorrhage and once you keep the trocar cannula there and remove the the, the needle part the, the blood can continuously flow it can't collapse because the cannula keeps it open and you can actually move the cannula on either side uh, up and down so that it can reach out to the pockets of liquefied blood. So the best way to drain supracoronal blood is use trocar cannula, directly go through the sclera and keep the trocar cannula there until it drains nicely and then remove it, put another place where there is still a mound, like that easily you can do it. Now in this case, I was wondering if since the supracoronal blood is already about a week and beyond, we could have actually tried to drain the blood first rather than remove the oil. Because you want at the, at the, at the end of the day a good oil support for the retina and you're only worried about the reducing the intraocular pressure which you can easily do by draining the blood why drain the oil first so if your attempts to drain the blood was negative then of course you have no choice except to tap a little bit of oil just to lower the pressure and save the optic disc so we don't want to remove too much of oil because it has a negative effect as we rightly said that it can actually perpetuate a hemorrhage as well it can the hemorrhage can recur sometimes when you make it too soft so, first I would have drained the supracoronal blood rather than tap this uh, silicone oil. Sir, uh, the uh, patient had a bell buckle also, sir. So, you would have to go posterior to the bell buckle to drain that, sir? No, no. There is no need to worry about the bell buckle. Just go next to the bell buckle and put it in. As I said, you can poke at anywhere in the area of the coronal hemorrhage. And you can go quite posterior. It doesn't have to be anywhere near the past panel because it's only occasionally that the supracoronal blood is as much in the supraciliary space as in the supracoronal space. The mound is mostly posterior, not anterior. So it's best that we expose and then go all the way up the equatorial region, use a higher then when you hook to retract the conjunctiva and poke with a, a trocar cannula system directly from the sclera. Nothing will happen. You can't reach the retina easily. Okay, and especially when you know you are at the highest mound of the supracoronal blood. That's how I would drain supracoronal hemorrhage, not worry about scale cut down these days. But yes, after having done that, if the supracoronal blood clot is very thick and you're not able to lyse it fully, you can actually remove the trocar cannula, make the scale cut a little longer, use a cyclodialysis spatula to actually yeah. lyse the clot and then drain it out. That way you will drain a lot more blood clot than just allowing blood to trickle by itself. And the second point I wanted to make is, in the presence of a supracoronal hemorrhage, which probably is also spilling over to the ciliary body area, 
I'm not sure how much TCP would be taken up by the CVD processes. Can Ronnie or somebody from the Glaucoma team answer the question? Like you said, uh, I'm not sure how much would uh, you would have actually uh, so, delivered to the ciliary uh, processes. So can yes, I make a yes, point? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No, your your point about uh, the reaching the ciliary processes, they're going to be anteriorly rotated with all the coronal effusion and the uh, inflammation. So I don't think it will be a problem to reach them. My only concern was they, when 30 spots were applied 180 degrees, that would have caused a lot of inflammation to increase the ciliary body edema. And that might have contributed to the flat anterior chamber. When he presented with the supracoronal yeah, hernia, itself, he, yes, ma'am. You said uh, the angle closure was the responsible for the uncontrolled glaucoma at the later stage. Yes, ma'am. How many weeks the AC was flat? The AC was flat for nearly about uh, two weeks, ma'am. The after it's the supracoronal hernia. Yeah, in, in the beginning also, it was shallow, ma'am. Right from post of day one. It was shallowing mm -hmm. of the AC. So, I mean, this can be easily removed at the, on the table and the angle can be opened up. It is an immediate post-operative period. I don't think that is that will cause a permanent closure and such a high pressures in such a short period of time. The second question, was there a pupillary block element also in the immediate post-operative period when the pressure went up? No, ma'am. The PI was patent and there was no oil in the AC, ma'am. No, no, no. I'm not talking about the oil. You can have oil in the chamber. You can still have the pupillary block. Because if you, we are, we are assuming the overfill is the cause for the glaucoma. Am I correct? Yeah, that's what we thought, ma'am, but... Uh... Uh, the was yes, ma'am. Cycloplegics. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Patient was on cycloplegics. So the pupil was dilating? Uh, it was already a non dilating pupil, so it was fixed, ma'am. Okay. He, he had a meiotic pupil. Yeah. So and and Sinica in the immediate post operative period can be released and uh, you can restore the normal flow. Especially in an eye. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. But when he did the supracoronal uh, hemorrhage drainage and a little bit of oil, the oil tapping, mm -hmm. the AC was reformed, ma'am. Yeah, at the same time, tapping the iris, because you know it was. Stuck uh, I had, I had done that, ma'am. I had tapped the iris back and I had formed mm -hmm. the AC, but mm -hmm. it didn't form very deeply like what you have normally. It mm -hmm. formed, but it was still shallow. So. Yeah, pushing that, releasing the sinicae will, we have done the cases that way. Releasing the sinicae can restore the normal flow. That's what I meant. Three weeks uh, happening, the permanent angle closure, it is amenable for restoring it back. Okay, I, I, I did tap the iris back and form the AC, but it didn't form completely. It, it was remaining shallow at the end of the procedure, ma'am. I think that may be because the supracoronal blood has not been drained fully. So there is something from behind which is pushing it forwards. The entire iris the diaphragm is being pulled, pushed forwards by the uh, blood which is there, supracoronal and supra body space as well. Possibly, sir. Yeah. 